subject we have been deeper into it. And my next speaker is Rebecca Ferguson. She's from all the way from England to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Ferguson is a lecturer at the Institution of Educational Technology at the Open University in London. And you're bringing the experience, I would say, from the bleeding edge of education. We really looking forward to what you have to tell us. And following your speech, we will have a discussion with two people and lots of them. Dr. Alcala, University of Stanford, and Dr. Alcala, University of Stanford, and Dr. Alcala, will join us on stage later. This is so professional, and it's very cool. Right. Thanks for having me. Right. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about something which has been helping as a solution to some of the problems in education. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the advantages of MOOCs and some of the challenges of MOOCs and give you a sort of more informed context to talk to you about them. So I'm from the Open University in the UK. Uh, the Open University is a distance learning uh, institution which has been running since 1970, awarding degrees since that time. It's the largest university in the UK and it's got an interest in both formal learning. Can you use my hand? Just a little bit. Okay, thank you. It's interested in both formal learning and in informal learning. So it's got a big presence on places like iTunes, YouTube, and also. Um, so, we come to distance education with quite a lot of experience. So, for those of you who haven't come across MOOCs or are not quite sure what they are, the, um, key, the key elements of them are the analysis that thousands of people can get involved in one course at the same time, uh, that they're open, there is no cost to join them, you might have to pay for a certificate at the end, but you can access all the resources for free. Uh, the majority of resources are available online, on the internet, and they're courses in that they're time bound if they have a beginning, they have an end, and they have a cohort who work through them. Uh, they're a concept that um, emerged in Canada, has some specific pedagogy in Canada, which next this moves, see moves. But they were really taken up in America, and that's where we hear all the hype coming from. You can see the cover of Time magazine here saying, um, people all over the world will be able to access a Harvard-style education for free. There will be an end to student debt. Uh, if one, piece, one professor will be able to talk to 100,000 students. Um, all great claims at the beginning. We're beginning to see the reality of those. Um, but that's why this has attracted so much interest. Uh, so at the Open University, we've taken a lead in a UK-based um, MOOC platform known as FutureLearn. Uh, which draws on our experience of distance learning and our understanding that it's more than just putting a series of resources up on the internet and asking people to work through them. Um, so FutureLearn has got a pedagogy of social learning, of trying to draw on the people who are involved in it and build up conversations to tell stories and to celebrate progress. And to give you a sort of sense of how these things can build up very, very quickly, um, the first partnership to FutureLearn were announced in December 2012. By September 2013, the first courses were online. They were capped because the registration was capped because this was still beta. Not more than 10,000 people could sign up for a course. And for the six of the first courses, 10,000 people did sign up. And for one of those courses, 10,000 people signed up in one day. So that's going from nothing to 10,000 students. Um, 200,000 registered users. Now, to put that in context, Stockholm University has got 66,000 students. So it's like going from nobody on Stockholm University campus to three courses running and everybody's in it the next day. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the things that um, we found from our experience at FutureLearn, which, granted, has only been running since September. Um, so there's bound to be more things to find out. And because I'm interested in educational technology, I'm talking from the perspective of teaching and learning. So once you've got into a MOOC, what are the advantages of it? Now, for a learner, there's the advantage that 100,000 people means you can access these resources free of charge. 
But once you're in, what's the advantage? You know, would it be better just to be learning as one person or 10 people or 100 people? What's the advantage of being with 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people? We found from our experience that there are advantages, um, that you can get support from a wide range of learners. And of course, with this model, that's very important because then you've got so many learners and you've only got one to 12 educators and they're only working on it part time. You need all the support you can get from your fellow learners. Um, you've got the resources which are provided by your fellow learners, and that's in the form of discussion comments, in the forms of challenges, in the forms of extension, in the forms of links out to other related resources. And you've also got access to a di range of diverse cultural perspectives. Now, in the limited time here, and I cannot tell you through all those, I'm just going to give you one example um, from a course, a fairly obscure sounding course, Tangential Photography, which Dan is one of our first moves. And um, not surprisingly, the people who signed up for dental photography were dentists, or they worked in dental practices. And one of the first discussions was, well, what do you use dental photography for? And I expect if you gave that a couple of minutes thought, you could think, well, yes, they use that for before and after shots. They use that to see how work is going. They give it to distress treatment in the future. But then somebody came on the forum and he said, I live in Paraguay. Very long quote, I'm afraid. But what he was basically saying was, I live in Paraguay. I live in this huge area. There's almost nobody involved in dental photography here. And these are the potentials that I see for it. I see the potential for research. I see the potential for education. I see the potential for political change. I see the potential for making our country a healthier place. So not only was this very isolated individual tying into a worldwide community through a MOOC, but also that worldwide community was getting a sense of what does this mean for us? What is the importance of our role? And could we take up some of these ideas? So there are advantages to learners at Massive. Are there any advantages to educators? Because a joy of being an educator is seeing somebody grasp something, of having that one-to-one -one relationship, of seeing what's going on in your classroom. If you've got 10,000 students, isn't that all lost? Well, we saw advantages for educators as well. One of them was effective benefits. But by that, I mean positive feelings about what they were doing. One is that they were getting increased access to resources. Um, so one of those things is the university might put in extra resources, um, create videos, things like that. Uh, one was that they could get access to, for example, um, free extracts from publications because people wanted to reach a wider audience. And one was that they got a motivation to um, enhance their teaching practice and to change their teaching practice. So again, just a couple of examples. The quote at the top, um, from the person leading the course of linguistics MOOC is very typical of what we were seeing coming from the educators. The words passionate came out a lot of times. The word excitement came up a lot of times. These are people who were writing emails, not talking to each other. They were each writing their own course email. And a lot of excitement about, they might have a fairly obscure area of research, because there's not a lot of people interested in course of linguistics, but they were linking into those people and really sharing their passion. And the one at the bottom from the West Science course shows how people were thinking about, well, can I change my practice in the view of what I'm doing here? Um, so not only was the lead educator here practicing what he preached, he was also getting the chance to model for 10,000 people what reflective learning looks like and what good practice looks like. And he was saying, it's not just something I tell you to do, it's something I do because it's important. So there are advantages for learners and educators. There are also advantages for society as a whole. Because if you've got 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people doing something, then there's a potential for change. So one of the advantages there, relatively small one, uh, you can develop tools and resources, um, people adding to websites, people producing posters, people producing videos, all of these resources that they can take out into the world and they can share online. A potential to develop professional practice. So we saw that in dental photography. Another example we had was the English national curriculum has just changed so that all schools have to teach programming to students, uh, which means a massive upskilling for teachers because teachers aren't necessarily um, able to teach programming. Uh, so we had a course on teaching programming, and that meant that 10,000 teachers could come in and learn that, and they could also take it back to their staff rooms 
and uh, cascade that knowledge very quickly. So there's a way of changing professional practice quite quickly and getting new ideas out there. Uh, there's obviously the increased access to higher education. People who, who couldn't physically get to a university, couldn't afford to get to a university, have access to these um, series of short courses. And there's also a potential for global impact. And the uh, reason that I've identified this is that the launch for Future Learn, um, our minister for higher education, David Willett, came along. And you'll see at the end there, he said, this will put the UK ahead in the global race to deliver education in worldwide markets. So as a politician, he's thinking beyond the individual learners, the individual institutions, he's thinking of what does this mean for the country as a whole. So that's some of the advantages that we've seen. So what are some of the challenges? It's not all good news, it's not all upbeat. Some of the big challenges are things that we've seen uh, mentioned in the media. One of them is the business model. How do you make it pay? That's a big um, issue. One of them is assessment. How do you assess people when you don't see them and you don't really know who they are? How do you cover that? So those are two things that you see in the media. I'm going to focus on the teaching and learning perspective once again. I'll pull out four of the challenges that we've seen. So one of those is that we've got inexperienced learners coming in there. So when you walk into the university classroom, people have been socialised since the age of five, six, seven to know what you do in a classroom. You come in, you sit down, you pay attention to the teacher, you keep quiet, you know how the day's going to run, you know how you're going to be assessed, all those things you know. When you come into an online classroom for the first time, you don't know any of that. You don't know where to focus your attention, you don't know what's going to happen at the end of it, you don't know what the expectations of you are. So a MOOC not only has to teach you subject content and the skills related to that, it also has to teach you how to learn online, how to learn in a massive environment. And it's got to take um, advantage of the fact that people don't know that sort of thing when they come in. The high levels of engagement, they are potentially really overwhelming. We saw some discussions with over 2,000 comments in them. So not only can that be overwhelming for students, it can also be overwhelming for educators who feel they have to be online all the time, reading these things, looking at it, Twitter, blogging about it. How do you cope with that? Now, there are ways of coping with that, but it's something you have to take into account from the beginning and not just start running your mood and say, oh, we haven't thought we were going to get all this interest because you do get this sort of interest. And it's also what sort of level do you teach it at? So when you've got higher education, you usually know what sort of qualifications people are coming in with, what sort of prior experience they've got. When you've got a MOOC, you've got people of 13, 14, 15 just coming in to see what higher education is like. But at the other end of the scale, you've got lecturers and professors coming in to find out what the MOOC is like, or coming in to say, are there any resources here which I could use in my classroom? You've got people who are complete novices, and you've got people who are working in the field wanting to get their masters. So you've got to decide who you're putting in your and how you're going to reach those people and not end up with a lot of people who are just vaguely interested but don't quite know what's going on. And the final point, this is, this is one that's increased um, a challenge for us to go to the university over the years. This is a survey here from one of our moves. Um, it's a starter course survey. I'm not claiming it's representative, it's just one, it's small numbers. Uh, but what we're seeing here is the percentage of people who are declaring some sort of disability, that's the orange spectrum. And over here we've got the percentage who say they're blind or partially sighted, that's 2.9%. The people who say um, that they've got some sort of hearing problem, so deaf or hard of hearing, 10.5%. That's partly because we see more people with disabilities accessing online education than you probably would do in a physical classroom. But think about how those numbers scale up. Oh, sorry, these are 2.9% of the people with a disability, not 2.9% across the board. Uh, but it means if you've got 10,000 students in your MOOC, you can expect about 145 of them to be deaf or hard of hearing. So if you're relying on a video, you need transcripts in there. You need some way of those people accessing them. If you've got 10,000 people in your MOOC, 
you can have 40 for a blind or partially sighted. That's more than most universities would see in a year, two years, five years. You can't give them individual support, so you've got to stick to the beginning. If it's a downloadable PDF, can they screen reader access it? If they're being asked to assess a draft in their assessment, how are they going to read that draft? Now, these are sorts of things that you have to take into account in your teacher education, but you haven't necessarily had to take into account if you've scaled before. And building these things in from the beginning can make a real difference. So I'm just going to end um, with a question for you. If you've been thinking about moots, if people you're working with have been thinking about moots, something to start to think about right from the beginning are what are your success criteria and whose perspective are you thinking from? Because if you're thinking from different perspectives, you have different success criteria. Now, so a lot of people on future learning come in and say, well, we just thought we thought we'd see what moots are like and try it out. It's so much more positive if you can think what you are trying to gain from it, what you want your learners to gain from it, and how you think you're getting there, and how you're going to make it success. But the brief overview of the advantages and the challenges of MOOCs are seen from future learning perspectives. I have a few questions before we jump into the discussion. I want to ask you the same question as for Greg. Um, given the code development, uh, will it disrupt the education system? Is it a change of area? I think it has the potential to disrupt the education system. Not necessarily. I think there's been a lot of claims to people disrupting the education system, and then it all goes back to the status quo. Um, I, I think you've really got to think through what you're going to achieve and how you want to achieve that. I don't think people have really reached that stage yet. And there are, like what the mayor pointed out in the, in the very beginning here, um, already, I mean, distance education is not really new. The possibility to put it online might be new, but we have experience from earlier. I think education at this scale is new. And, but, and it's the difference that scale is making, which, which is the new deal and the disruptive fact, I think. And when it comes to, to the individual, uh, with the responsibility to learn, how to learn, be even bigger for the individual. Yes, but I don't think the individual necessarily realise that you need to learn how to learn because they've done it all their lives in schools. They think they know how to do that. Uh, so it's something that you've got to raise your awareness of in the first place. Where somebody else was responsible, the teacher was responsible yeah, but for your learning. Didn't realise necessarily. Teacher never said to you, today we're going to learn how to sit down in the classroom. Today you're going to learn how to look at me. Today we're going to learn how to uh, sit down and, and work together. Um, you didn't necessarily see that as a skill that you learned, but it was a skill that was learned, and you've got to do the same online. Thank you, Rebecca. Stay with us on stage. Uh, and I will... We will now go to the high school and the Lundgren of the Rönningia Habakkuk. Jag tänkte börja med den frågan som jag också gav i detta till er. Kommer det här att revolutionera svensk utbildning? Lars får börja. Det kommer att förbli väldigt starkt inflytande, men ska jag vara alldeles ärlig, nej det är inte en revolution, det är inte detta som är en revolution av svensk revolution, det måste vara något mer än distributionen och det måste vara mer inflytande system för högre utbildning än vad man har möjlighet att utbilda. Så universiteten kan känna sig lugna och trygga, utbildningen kommer att gå på samma sätt i Sverige som, som i många hundra år? Nej, det tycker du inte om. Alltså, universiteten kommer inte till att kunna vara lugna och trygga men jag tror inte att det samtliga på utmaningen av det här. Man har en lätt nervositet inför nog. 
eh, och det är lika rätt i grann. Jag tror inte det ska, eh, Jag tror det är viktigt i en stad. Jag tror det är väldigt värdefullt. Men jag tror inte det är något som är bra för någon insättning för personer och utbildning. Jag återkommer till vad som i sådana fall är det största hoten. Jag skulle vilja höra vad Lotta Henrik tror om, om revolutionerande teknik och påverkan på det statliga utbildningssystemet, kanske primärt högre utbildning. Så då har du en mikrofon och Lotta, så får du ta den. Ja, ja nej, men jag tänkte på det, för jag såg en nyhet här i veckan om Google som nu överger de amerikanska universiteten. Och eh, på grund av att de, de utbildar inte de förmågor som de vill ha, utan de menar på att de amerikanska universiteten är bara en förlängning av high school och gymnasieskolan och de får en utbildning i traditionell ledarskap som inte är intressant för dem, utan de söker förmågor och det får de inte i den, i den traditionella amerikanska universitetsutbildningen. Så det tycker jag säger det. Vill du fylla på en så passa på att titta lite nu. Du tar det lite kort. Jag har inte tänkt så mycket på det, men du fick mig att tänka på om det är helt fel. Var det så att ledningen satt på Stadsbiblioteket i Stockholm en gång i världen? Eh, om man då hade knackat direkt på honom och sagt att nu är det dags för revolution, då hade man också haft riktigt själv på det. Eh, jag tänkte man inte att ja, men det är ju en revolution där borta i just den här mannen. Om du med det menar revolution, nej. Om Stockholms lärare har annat kön så kan man ge det i Sverige 68. Kommer ni ihåg korrektionsoperationen i nuvarande handelsskolan? Det var ju vad vi kallade för svensk revolution. Men det blev ju inte mycket revolution. Så nej, revolution kan inte bli. Men det är nog lika bra att göra det. Det är ju inte en av alla som har lite tanke, så det är klart att det är en förändring. Det är klart att det är det. Det är klart att det är Men inte revolution av typen ledning. De möjligheter som Rebecka pekar på här då, och som den engelska utbildningsministern också pekar på, är det här en marknadsmöjlighet för de som vill skapa nya utbildningsformer som når en annan grupp, förutom de som väljer att gå på universitet kanske? Är det en möjlighet? Du hugger för det här Absolut. Ja. Jag tänker innan jag glömmer det så måste jag nämna några personer jag har hänt genom att prata om i kraften eller sådär. Anna Kelly, Johan Svensson. Ja, äh, det där löser jag tror jag. Ja. Jag, tror, jag, jag tror nämligen ni tillhör dem som just nu tycker att det här systemet är up for grabs om man har med engelska. Och jag tror ni kommer att lyckas ganska långt. Så ja, absolut. Det här är ju en gigantisk affärsmöjlighet. Ett system som inte är bra och levererar tillräckligt bra kommer alltid utmanas för det senare. Och just nu är det några som gör det. Rebecka har ju onekligen just nu tagit av studenter från mitt universitet, KTH. Det är rätt intressant, tycker jag. Så ja, det är klart att kommersiella krafter tar plats. De som funderar på det med Nans Lotta berättar vad som är spännande. Kommersiella krafter på väg in. Ja, men det som är intressant här också, tycker jag, det är, alltså, det är ju också det här att man får börja på... på den nivå man är på. Man behöver alltså inga speciella förkunskaper. Utan man får gå in, man får söka en utbildning, man kan komma som professor eller man kan komma när man får gymnasieskolan. Och det här är, det, det är banan ju också en ny väg. Alltså. Så att, och jag menar, det, det, finns ju andra universitet, det finns ju andra universitet som satsar på likadant som har de här utbildningarna online. Så att, alltså att, jag tror nog att det kommer och alltså det här håller ju på att skapa ett förändringsbygg. Det är ju så. Även om det kanske inte blir revolution, men nu kommer det att skapa förändring. Jag vill föra in ett flera gärna sätt här, och det är relevansen som vi har pratat med på. Att utbildningssystemet kanske inte är tillräckligt relevant för, för näringsliv. Är det här en väg att införa utbildning som är verkligen direkt in i vad företag och arbetsmarknad behöver? Vill du svara så? Ja, det är en stor fråga. Ja, alltså det är inte utdrag. Det här är inte, jag tror utan tag att... Så det är komplement snarare än konkurrens? Ja, det är komplement. Ja. Det är fråga om komplement, inte fråga om konkurrens i den traditionella universitetsundervisningen, tror jag. Ja, alltså jag tror att jag inser att jag framstår som oerhört konservativ i det här gänget. Men eh, det finns ju tre institutioner som har överlevt genom medicinen och det är nog ingen tillfällighet att universiteten är inte inom de tre institutionerna. Sen kan jag också förskräcka sig över det som de första talare har pratat om, att det är ett klassrum idag och det är precis lika långt ut som på medeltiden. Och det gör det för att vi här och nu också, vi står här fram och här fram och tittar. Ganska traditionell uppsättning. Och så finns det någonting att 
as I know so far. Um, at the moment, the trouble with running MOOCs for people under the age of um, 13 is that you then have a big duty of care for looking after them and for thinking about how they relate to other people they're meeting online. And that is quite a challenge to be meeting on top of other things. Um, so at the moment, we're not seeing a lot of MOOCs um, for designed for people, I would say under the age of 16. I mean, university is very interested in attracting pe people in you know, 16, 17, 18 who might want to sign up for universities, uh, but they're not very interested at the moment in providing things which sit alongside traditional school subjects. Thank you. I think we leave it by that. Um, do you remember Martin's question? Now I've got lost. <laughs> <laughs> Please repeat it again. So my question is that uh, MOOCs involves a lot of development of new technological tools and platforms. Many of these methods could be used and already are used in, say, traditional school education and university education. Say, for instance, by flipped learning, changing, uh, making the students have lectures online and using the classroom time for other things. So I 
wonder if we could uh, speculate a bit on the development of MOOCs on traditional university and school education. Okay, so one of the things we're seeing with FutureLearn is because it has 26 university partners, it's a reason for bringing universities together. I think usually when you come together as people from universities, you come together as researchers. But in this context, people are coming together as teachers and they're talking about how they approach teaching, how they approach um, the learning which is going to go on in these environments. They're sharing good practice. Um, and ideas are coming out. For example, we've got a focus on learning through narrative and through storytelling. Um, some universities have taken that up very strongly, and it's something that I don't think they'd normally do in their day-to-day face-to-face practice in the past. Uh, but they take it up. So, for example, Chuck Clyde, which is running a, a MOOC on forensic psychology, uh, ran alongside that and made a mystery video. So each week you got another element of the murder mystery, and it was looking at, you know, how do we look at where the bullets came from? How do we look at the fingerprints? How do we look at the footwear prints that were left behind? How do we weigh this up? And on the very last day of the course, on the very last evening of the course, um, First of all, there was a vote as to who people thought had done it on the basis of the evidence. And then they said, could you reflect on the real case? And in the real case, this is the verdict that was put forward. And that was a sort of, that was a developing, unfolding story which kept people engaged, which kept people seeing uh, what the relevance of the learning was to a real world situation. And which kept them talking to each other and engaging each other. Now, developing things like that in a mood where you expect it to be something a little bit new, is then something you can take back to um, your formal face-to-face classroom and, and say, well, that works in this context, but it can't in that context. So I think there are potentials to change there, especially as we keep on talking about it and keep on going back to the pedagogy and how to do that the pedagogy better. So it's a good circle there that can inspire and virtue each other. Yeah. Next question. I have a question for Greg. So, what is different in Lucas? I mean, very much like your your case uh, for not incremental change, but time dimension. Uh, questions around who will provide who will provide that transformational change. See, in other disciplines in education, it pretty much always comes to entrepreneurs. And I wonder if you think entrepreneurs are needed. It is a very good question, and I think my answer to that is this is all about social innovation, and so I think it's really important that the change involves social innovators and entrepreneurs. However, I think the change has to involve all members of society, where I started my book, because education impacts everyone here. It impacts all of us. And unless we're all willing to make the change, then we're going to be where we are, to be honest. So I think it's it's not just saying, let's put it all on the shoulders of entrepreneurs, or let's put it all on the shoulders of educators, or let's put it all on the shoulders of government, until we start to realize that this is, I chased in the US for a long time, because I could see that the government gives billions of dollars, well, hundreds of billions of dollars to defense, and nothing much to education. And I said, let's call education a national security issue, because it is. It really is. And so, we've got to involve, we've got to start to look at the the mode of partnership for social innovation as a way to do that and being involved the catalyst organisations but also the other supporting organisations. So should educators and the school system do more to encourage entrepreneurial participation? Are there arenas for these people to meet? I just looked at the list here today. There's mostly uh, government agencies and and, uh, federal representatives like the HMRC. I think one of the things we need to do is, is get to a point where we're all comfortable with innovation happening. And so today, we, today currently, I believe, I didn't have an argument in that here, but I believe our current models aren't structured for um, deep innovation happening at the classroom level. It happens in isolation, but not, in, not, in, not across whole systems. And so until we get that, you get this isolated body, some are good, some are, some are not good type situation. Education lottery, and I 
we've got a new type of and say, how do we create innovation that happens? This education can't be static. It has to be evolving with society. And by evolving with society, then, a lot of it is sexually dangerous. We've got to see innovation. It's got to become a, a living, learning laboratory because otherwise it is too easily misreaded, particularly when it's in times of rapid change, which we live in. Thank you. One last question. I'm going back to the panel again. My question is going to Like you said, shouldn't we instead encourage our students to become entrepreneurs instead? Because we do see that as Sweden as a small country, we can't be a land that produces products because we're too expensive. So we can produce products and services uh, like software, for example, and we have a fantastic startup team here right now. We're one of the hottest in Europe, which is fantastic. So my question is, shouldn't we instead encourage our students to become entrepreneurs, to follow their dreams, to take that last step and create amazing new innovative products? But I think that school needs to be a part of this. So this is an open question. What, what do you guys think about this? I give the word to Henrik. Yes. Use the microphone. Okay. Yep. It's also for the webcast. Jag, jag är cirka 50 år plus minus. Det beror lite på hur man tänker. Det svårt att... Sen dess har jag sett de här sakerna dyka upp. Du hörs. Prata i micken. Mm. Och det har vi alla andra. Och vi har sett bransch efter bransch efter bransch efter bransch förändras. Så den som tror att utbildningsvärlden inte förändras, den måste ju vara tvärblind. Så långt vet vi massvis. Om vi sedan lägger intellektuellt Sen kan man älska det eller inte. Jag har råkat till att höra om och gillar det. Ett affärsperspektiv på det också. Då får du svar på din fråga du också. Direkt skulle jag just vilja säga. Och då skulle vi kunna se den typen av frågor vi själva ställer just nu. Som är klockrent synonyma med att den musikindustrin blir irriterad över downloading till exempel. Är det bra kvalitet eller dålig kvalitet? Klassisk fråga. Hur ska systemet upprätthållas? Hur ska monopolet försvaras? Vem kommer ta över? Eh, hur skapar vi mer situationen? Det finns, det finns en kokbok för allt det där. Just nu skulle jag vilja påstå att i Sverige har vi ungefär 150 e-learning startups med grund universitetskoppling. I huvudsak är det drivna av svenska studenter. Det skulle jag vilja påstå är mer än vad den offentliga totala universitetssektorn lägger pengar just nu på att utveckla sin egen framtid. Det är ju rätt absurd om jag råkar jobba på KTH, vi omsätter 4 miljarder. Jag tror det var svaret på många frågor här inne. Det är min hypotet, ja. Tack snälla. Jag kommer ta ett streck där. Det fanns många, många fler som hade frågor eller ville göra inlägg. Jag hoppas att vi får tid till det efter pausen som följer nu. 